What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. Today, we've got something really uh, exciting lined up. I've got Vivas on the line coming back for another podcast. Um, Vivas, welcome to HyperChange. Thanks for having me again, Gally. Yeah, so um, I kind of been brainstorming on this topic of electric vehicles and particularly Tesla in India, the opportunity there, um, did a live stream about it, have been talking to you about it and just realized like I've been super fascinated by this potential of India, the world's largest country by population potentially in the next couple of years. Uh, second largest English speaking population, just huge, huge potential as a rapidly growing economy and analyzing the sort of energy and transportation markets there. Um, and you and me have been talking about it. You. Uh, built this amazing slide presentation that we're going to go through in this episode. I'll, we'll put a link. So if anybody wants to download and follow along, let's just kick it right off. Um, what do you got for us? So many of you know that I have been in this space for a very long time and I'm a huge fan of electrification. And this conversation is very meaningful to me because I was born in India. My whole family still lives in India. And although I've lived in the U.S. now for about 20 years, I still maintain a very strong connection to India. India is a beautiful country. There's a lot of cultural beauty. There's a lot of history. There's something for everyone there. And almost every single time that a friend of mine from the West has gone to visit India, they've been blown away. Unfortunately, not everything about India is beautiful. India also has 15 of the top 20 most polluted cities in the world, according to the World Health Organization. Wow. Health concerns stemming from air pollution are a very real pro problem in India. And as a result, the idea of using electric vehicles, the idea of using clean energy is not just something that's, you know, a great market opportunity. It's something that's very needed to secure the future for the massive population that lives in India. Yeah. And my favorite saying is like, the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. We have a long way to go to electrify the transportation system in India, build the sort of grid infrastructure and energy production infrastructure to get it to be a renewable energy economy. So I see massive challenges and decades of work ahead, but I also see a massive opportunity in those next decades to rebuild all of this infrastructure. And, you know, so as much as there's a problem, I'm like, wow, this is a huge opportunity as well. Absolutely. And India is a vibrant economy that has been attracting Western businesses for a very long time. So India is the second, India has the second largest population of English speakers in the world behind the United States. It's also the largest democracy in the world. And as a result, Western businesses look to India as a natural place, as a natural secondary end market for their products. There's a lot of collaboration between businesses in the United States, businesses in India many examples, which we will touch on later today. But on this topic of electrifying the grid, electrifying transportation, this is one where there's still a lot more work to be done in India. And so the goal of this conversation is just to show what is the current state, the battery supply chain of the electric vehicle market, but then also what can be done with companies like Tesla, with companies like Arkhamoto, to ensure that this industry continues to grow so that we don't ever have to face a reality where 15 out of the top 20 most polluted cities in the world are in India. Totally. And so with that, kick us off on slide five, maybe where it's looking like we're breaking down at a high level, the transportation India, the transportation market in India today, rapidly growing plane system, rapidly growing railway system. They do have a rapidly growing automotive market, although at just 4 million units, it's a lot smaller than countries that are their size. Um, so maybe, you know, what's going on here at a high level? Absolutely. So transportation in a country of 1.3 billion people is a fascinating topic, but it's very different than what we may encounter in the Western world. The primary mode of transportation between cities and around the country for a very long time was the railroad system, which is why we put it right in the middle of this page. So what you see over here is the central station in Chennai, India, which is my hometown. And what you will see is it looks quite British in its architecture, and there's a reason why. Much of the railroad system that is operational in India today was built during the colonial empire, almost 200 years ago. And it is still the heartbeat of logistics for the country. You know, it's the second largest, excuse me, it's the fourth largest railroad system in the world, and the second busiest, only behind China. And people of all income classes you know, all the way from 
laborers and farms to well-educated urban elites, if you want to call them that, all rely on the railroad system. Even I take the train when I go to India still. I mean, it's a very egalitarian form of transportation. Yeah, and I'm very curious because in the U.S. we sort of have, I don't want to call it a failing train system, but like nobody really takes the train. It's way more convenient and faster to drive in a lot of situations versus Europe where it's way more convenient to take the train and everybody, the trains are sort of more modernized and that's a much bigger uh, piece of the economy. Same with like Japan when I was there or China. So I'm curious, where does India fit in that kind of spectrum of, is it more like, you know, the European countries where just compared to the roads, it's a much more efficient way to get around with the rails because the road infrastructure hasn't caught up necessarily. Europe is a, is a good comparable to think about when it comes to India over here. So for example, today I live in San Francisco. If I wanted to go down to LA, I would either go there on autopilot in my Tesla or I would fly there on Southwest Airlines, right? If this were India, I wouldn't even hesitate. I would take the train from San Francisco to LA. However, that mentality is changing because low cost carriers have become such a big deal in India. So, I mean, hundreds of millions of people are flying for the first time ever in the last five years in India because of the rise of low cost carriers. Back in December, I was back at home for a cousin's wedding and then I flew from Mumbai to Delhi and I showed up to the airport in Mumbai. I paid $27 for a flight to Delhi. I just went to the gate and took whatever flight was available to go to Delhi. Wow. People still treat that's it awesome. like a railroad system, <laughs> right? Because that's the only comparable that they have. So it's important to note once again, that before we get into automotive, the planes, the low cost carriers are a big deal. The railroads are a big deal. So then the scope of automotive is within densely populated urban areas. And it's also not really comparable to how we think about transportation here in the US. People aren't really gonna be using cars to go long distances. It's gonna be a game of dense urbanization there. And I think this is a fascinating moment to move on to the next slide six of the underpenetration of the vehicle market, which is sort of what we're getting to. And that difference of we've seen Tesla push rapidly into China, another country with 1.3 billion people. So why are they moving so fast there, investing so quickly there? Maybe there's some geopolitical uh, stuff going on, but really it's just that China had to develop 20 million car per year passenger vehicle market. So despite India's population being so much higher, it's really like the more I look at this data, I'm like, wow, this is in it's incredibly underpenetrated per uh, you know person in India, the amount of vehicles that are sold. Um, and that's what this chart's showing here, like only 4 million cars sold per year. India has like what, quintuple the population of the US, but sells one fifth the amount of cars. Like it's pretty crazy. China and India are oftentimes talked about as comparables because they're both large Asian superpowers with populations of over a billion people. But this is one instance of many in which India and China are very, very different countries. So like you said, only 4 million vehicles out of the 100 million vehicles sold last year were in India. We also don't expect a lot of growth in this market like we see in this chart. So obviously now in 2019 and 2020, there's been a big hit due to a global auto recession in 2019 and then COVID in 2020. But even then, our friends at Row Motion, and I'd like to thank my friend Adam from Row Motion for sending us this data, they don't really expect much of a growth in the Indian automotive market because once again, the primary consumers are gonna be in dense urban areas and people are gonna continue to rely on city buses, on train systems, on low cost carriers. And automotive, the automotive segment will have very specific uses in India, unlike the United States or unlike Europe. Yeah, and it's, it's really surprising to see that the growth rate, they're expecting to be lower than GDP, because even if it, here it says if it grew at GDP's rate, that would be 16 million a year, which would be, you know, catching up to China, crazy growth. So I'm sort of curious about that because I would think it could grow faster than GDP potentially, you know, taking a sort of different side of road motion because... I've heard, you know, some research on massive road infrastructures happening. And then as well as you have sort of the more a middle class and wealthier class emerging rapidly, like that disposable income of amount of people who can actually purchase these vehicles in tandem with, you know, Tesla coming to market with cheaper and cheaper electric vehicles and other OEMs doing that. Like maybe we could sort of see a flip here where vehicle growth accelerates beyond GDP growth. I wonder like how set in stone is this? Or are we really, you know, locked into the fact that India is just not going to be using four-wheel cars the same way China and the U.S. are. If, if we could predict the future perfectly, we would have retired by now a long time ago. <laughs> but point. here's how I'm interpreting this data. Yes, I do see a scenario in which population growth 
GDP growth are less than automotive growth. But that said, where is the majority of population growth happening in India today? It's happening in densely populated urban areas where once again, the story is not defined by the ownership of vehicles. The story is defined by the usage of services, especially of like tuk-tuks, three-wheelers, and your middle class, your average middle class millennial. Like if I were to move to India, I wouldn't buy a car. I'd buy a two-wheeler. And as we can see over here on slide six, two-wheelers really define the story when it comes to the car market, the, the mobility market for the consumer class in India. 80% of the market is for two-wheel motorcycles. And, you know, like there's just no getting around it. Yeah, it's funny because it's, it's like there's not that many cars. Market. Where How are all these people getting around? And then I look at this slide and I'm like, oh, that's the other 15 or 20 million vehicles that are moving all the people and stuff around these cities. Two-wheelers and three-wheelers. Like massive tens of billions of dollars a market of OEM selling these different vehicles. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Like when you're in India, what are you seeing in terms of like on the streets? Like everyone has their own kind of scooter situation. These three wheelers, are those used for deliveries? Are they used for taxing people around? Um, like, like how does this sort of work? All of the above. So two wheelers and three wheelers are the primary mode of transportation for most of the urban dwelling class. Yes, the upper classes will generally tend to have cars with dedicated drivers. Um, being a driver is still a well-employable profession in India today. But two-wheelers and three-wheelers are used for point-to-point, -point, last mile within cities for logistics and for people. I'm really curious about is if, you know, is the rest of the world a preview of the future of where India is headed? Or is India a preview of the future where the world is headed? Because if we think about what's happening with really rapidly increasing urbanization, um, you know, people moving to cities, dense urban populations, like it seems like we're headed towards getting to the congestion levels of Indian cities, but all around the world, you're just a little bit ahead of the curve there. And as we get denser, you know, this use case of new form factors, why was bird so explosive? I keep harping on this, like one of the most fasted adopted consumer products ever reached a $2 billion valuation. Everyone's saying it's a bubble or is everyone, nobody's taking note to be like, why was there such a product market fit here? The, the use case for personal last mile sort of personal mobility solutions beyond just a four wheeled car is, you know, I, I just really feel like there's a huge growth there and the ur whole urbanization movement, um, you know, Arkimoto, I'm an investor in that company, uh, you know, they're building a two, three wheeler sort of device that seems perfect for the urbanization, the Indian market, um, and potentially where everyone else is headed. So the more I really dive down to this, you know, I think this is potentially Tesla's biggest threat besides our, you know, whole battery supply chain, uh, not enough materials is that maybe the car isn't the best way to get around anymore. You know, maybe we should rethink about 80% of our trips, we're driving in a car that's built for five people, but we only have one person in it with no stuff. And, you know, we're using six times the amount of batteries and raw material resources we need to get that one person around. It's a massive waste of energy and efficiency um, if we're not filling butts in all of these seats. And so, you know, the more and more I think about this, I think in some ways, this may be a preview of future urban economies and, and how those transportation systems look. A lot more two and three wheelers than four wheelers. That statement is true if you assume that there's no more infrastructure development, which Elon is trying to solve with the boring company, right? So in the absence of creating roads on surfaces, we would have tunnels so that there would just be more space in which vehicles can operate. But what you see with the rapid urbanization in India, but also just in developing countries around the world, I mean, you know, I've been to Brazil many times and I see a lot of these same trends playing out in Brazil. There's so much rapid urbanization due to economic opportunities being clustered in urban areas that space on the road space and real estate is rationed in a way that i just haven't seen it being rationed while living here in the western world and if if we assume that that level of urbanization is also going to happen in the west then yeah owning a big expensive car that takes up a lot of space on the road just isn't the paradigm that will succeed totally and so moving forward a little bit to, you know, rapidly increasing urbanization, uh, the Indian government is kind of accepted this, you know, massive pollution problem. Fossil fuels are sort of, you know, polluting our cities, causing all these health effects. They accept that they need to transition to EVs quickly. So can you fill us in a little bit about what the government's been doing um, from a policy standpoint to spur that adoption? The Indian government has played a key role in policy towards electric vehicles 
for almost a decade now. The central organization that is leading this effort from the government is called Niti Ayog, which is basically like the central think tank for the government of India. And they've been key to advising a lot of these policies that you see on this slide over here. So the first major policy push started in 2020, where it was all about how do we get faster EV adoption with the goal of getting about six to seven million EVs and hybrids by 2020. Now, once again, market was like four million, right? And they were saying, let's get six to seven million on the road by 2020. So they were assuming a certain growth rate, which didn't happen. So then they went back to the drawing board and then they put out the FAME phase one, which was pivotal legislation for EVs in India back in 2015. And they said, initially within two years, we're going to dole out about 8 billion rupees of incentives to get manufacturing of electric vehicles done in India. Manufacturing of electric two-wheelers and electric three-wheelers. And a lot of companies were born out of this effort, which we'll explore later in the presentation. And this is a key point that I want to dive down really quick, because India seems to be very uniquely big on, maybe very wisely, on in like the, doing things locally and requirements mm -hmm. for local parts and local manufacturing. And that's been a big roadblock, in my understanding, of Tesla being able to enter that there is they, they don't want to import cars that they build in California and that friction. So I think it's interesting to see how even at this level of policy, they're really pushing for that domestic supply chain and domestic production. Gally, it's because it's all about the jobs, my friend. Imagine that you're a politician in a country of 1.3 billion people and you have to get hundreds of millions of people employed. The reason for domestic manufacturing capability in India has very much to do with getting people employed so that you create that economic value multiplier effect within the communities. So moving on, you know, the, the last major piece of legislation, so this happened when I was in India back in 2019, was they announced in the union budget for the year, a cutting down of the goods and services taxes for both electric vehicles and for EV chargers. Up until right before COVID, India had only 300 chargers in the country, okay? Dude, I think that within the Silicon Valley area, there's more than 300 chargers. But in a country of like 1.3 billion people, there's 300 chargers. So this charger thing is a really big problem. Wow, and that's and of like saying, today. Yeah, that's as of right before COVID. And then as you can imagine, India's just been in lockdown for the last four months. So it's not like this number has grown that much since then. So the impetus was let's get more EVs on the road and let's get more chargers going. And India has done a very good job throughout its history of using industrial policy through subsidies and through um, penalties. China has done that very effectively. They've just done it much faster on this question of electrification than India has. But if you were to look at other comparable industries like telecom, um, like logistics in India, using penalties, using subsidies, there's many different models where the Indian government has succeeded in deploying these policy tools to make it happen. So right now, what's important to know from a policy standpoint is the GST rates have come down for EVs and for chargers. This is, the aim was to spur more development of EVs and chargers with this. Coming out of COVID, we'll see what happens. Ideally, however, they would keep the GST low for these two categories. The other problem to recognize is the import duty for cars into India is very high. So here's just one example over here. CBU import duties, which means completely built units. If you want to bring a car from outside of India into India, you're going to- That would be like a Tesla that they built in California. Like a example. Tesla built in California, importing it would be like 50 to 100% tariff on top. So the first ever Tesla in India uh, was bought by a Bollywood actress. Her name is Janelia D'Souza. She bought it from <laughs> Hong Kong and she imported it into, into the country. And this also ironically happened. I read about it in the newspaper when I was in India last summer. And she probably had to pay like 100% import duty to make it happen. You can do that when you're a Bollywood actress, but imagine the average person. Like even I, let's say I were living in India today, even I wouldn't pay 100% import duty. The primary metric of consumer purchases for a vast majority of the income classes in India is cost. So when you slap a 100% tariff on something, it doesn't even pass metric number one. Like they can't go to evaluating other metrics. And, and to be so fair, they problems. were already like like behind in terms of 
you know, per capita income to be able to afford something like a luxury sedan, you know, and then you on top of that slap another massive, like the market for luxury sedans and cars already much, very pretty small. And then on top of that, if you have to have a massive tariff, it's like, okay, like it's not even worth pushing into, it seems like, and that's been Tesla's policy. But there are- Yeah, that's a great segue. That's a great segue into, into slide nine, where all these policy actions with fame, with the union budget, it's motivated both new startups and incumbents in India to manufacture products for multiple income segments that are electrified. So just a few examples over here. Hero, the first company on the, on the, on the incumbent section, has been one of the biggest manufacturers of two-wheelers in India for decades now. I mean, like I remember being on Hero uh, motorcycle since I was like two years old, basically. Uh, not that I had a memory back then, but you know what I mean. Maruti Suzuki has been operating in India for a very long time. Um, yeah, I mean, Mahindra, you know, one of the most well-known automotive brands in India. These are all companies that have been operating for a very long time. And they saw the promise of electrification. They started introducing new electric models even over the last decade. Have Obviously you heard of not this, the uh... same volumes that we're seeing in China or the US or Europe, but slowly as a trickle, it has started. Yeah, it's cool to see that that government policy really has spurred innovation in the like sort of local OEM market for these electric vehicles. One that I'm looking at right now that I've heard a lot about in the comments from my last video is Ather. Or Ather. Ather. Um, it looks yeah. kind of like a cool, like trendy sort of like Vespa, but that's electric 3.9 to 0 to 40 KMP, uh, 55 to 75 kilometer range, like really small, but like really affordable. I guess for zipping around the cities, this is perfect. Honestly, I kind of want one. I'm, I'm like looking at it right now. I'm like, this looks pretty sweet. Like, yeah, I got to. I got to run on my friend's Ather for the first time in Bangalore last year. And it's exactly what you described, right? It's for it's for the urban dweller who doesn't want their vehicle to take up a lot of space and is able to take their vehicle and charge it inside their home. So Ather is a great example of that. But the policy, like you said, all the policy actions have spurred new companies into innovating into this space. Another couple of examples over here. So, so Sun Mobility, you know, this is a great example. These guys are putting out three-wheelers um, that are electrified into the Indian market. I think that they were the first ones to really do it at big scale. So we expect more of these types of companies to come up, building products for the specific niche segments that are relevant to India and for the use cases in India. And I want to talk about use cases really quickly, because this is something I learned about in my research with Sun Mobility. And um, if you haven't checked out Sun Mobility, uh, I highly recommend you guys do. This is, a, this is a company that I find very exciting in India. So. One of the leaders of Sun Mobility is a gentleman called Chetan Maini, who founded what was probably one of the first electric vehicle companies in India. It's called Reba, and they were acquired by Mahindra. Sun Mobility is the next move over here. They're working on a solution with three wheelers that involves battery swapping. So while the chargers are severely lacking in India, swapping is seen as a potential solution. Why? Because when you're a three wheel operator, what you care about is maximizing your time on the road. That way you can transport more people, you can transport more goods, you can increase your income. And charging for 30, 40 minutes versus swapping in two minutes, I mean, that's a very real income difference for a small business operator on a three-wheeler right there. Yeah. So that's why the swapping business model has become just as important in India as the charging. And you're setting us up perfectly for the next piece of our conversation, which is the electric grid. And I guess what you're getting at there is also like, well, if the grid's not ready to handle the charging, there's not enough chargers, then maybe this system of swapping could be a lot more efficient. Um, and I guess this is, you know, shout out to Viv, my friend who commented on when I was asking about questions about this episode, you know, her point was like, how are we talking about electric vehicles in India if the grid's not reliable? And they have, you know, her point was they were rate, I think 80 out of 137 countries in terms of grid reliability. You've mentioned to me in our conversations that, you know, you've been experienced frequent blackouts when you go visit there. Um, so I'm curious, you know, if, if we're gonna be running around electric vehicles, we need to be able to charge them all up and we need to do it with clean energy. And it seems like as much as that's also a problem in the US and Europe, it's really even much more of a problem in India of getting the grid to that level to where it can handle mass adoption of EVs. Um, and that's like a whole nother piece of the issue. So I'm really excited to dive into this piece because I think this is probably the biggest barrier for EV adoption in India. If you look at slide 13, 
what you say is very, very true about grid reliability having been an issue previously. So a decade ago, the deficit of supply versus demand for electricity was double digit percentage. And now that number has been slowly coming down over time. I mean, I will give the Indian government and players in the Indian energy markets credit that, and these are statistics directly from the Ministry of Power in India, that the deficit has been reducing over time. However, a deficit still does exist and reliability of the grid itself is still complicated. The solution around that has been the uptake of more renewables and more behind the meter. So if we look at slide 11, what we see is, you know, on the left-hand side, because of COVID, total electricity generation fell in April, 2019. What was the only category that grew? Renewables. Wow, so, so this is already happening. Falling, it's already happening and it's been happening for a long time. Now, if you were to look over it on a comparable year per year basis, which you see on the right hand side, it's, it, it's a tough story because over the span of a year, you know, COVID had such a severe impact that the right hand side is the only story that's now being reported in the mainstream media. But I think the left hand side is even more important, which is that not even a pandemic could stop the fact that Indian companies, Indian consumers, the Indian government prefers a renewable led growth. Much of the conversation around climate change, when it comes to countries and climate change, always poses the question of, well, how can we institute the parent climate, the Paris Climate Accords? If you have billions of people in China and India aspiring to the quality of life that we have here in the Western world. And I think that they're not mutually exclusive arguments. You can give people in India, people in China, the quality of life that Western countries do have over time without sacrificing the energy grid, without dumping the atmosphere with a lot of carbon. And as we see over here on the left-hand side of this page, India has made a choice to go with renewables. I hope this trend continues. It's pretty crazy to see that 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 it's more than 10% of the energy generated was from renewable sources in April. Like that's pretty awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And this has been a trend that's been a long time coming. So over, over here on slide 12, we see each of these circles on this page is a major utility scale solar generation deployment over the last decade, right? And I mean, we see some of these big projects like the, the Bedla Solar Park in Rajasthan 2200 peak power megawatts. I mean, that is a serious commitment for a project right there. So the government has been very strong in deploying solar, but it's not just going to take the government. What we see in India over here on slide 14 is if you were to segment the market for expansion of clean energies, including battery storage, right? This is how I would kind of quickly define them. Government, like we said, has been going out and doing tenders and has been instituting these new projects. Rural areas in India are still the areas that are hardest hit when it comes to electricity reliability, access to grid infrastructure, just access to infrastructure in general. And that's a problem that is mostly being solved by the government because the business opportunity is hard to come by for somebody who's trying to build a, build a large grid out there. The solution out there is something more like off-grid solar, community solar, behind the meter generation, individual solar power plants um, that we've seen throughout the developing world. Your non-rural consumers, what are they using solar? What are they using renewables for? Well, if they don't get renewable electricity directly from the grid, they're usually using it as their backup power sources. So in our family home when I was growing up, whenever the power would trip off because we'd have a blackout, we'd have a diesel generator that immediately kicked in. And this is something that a lot of middle-class families in India have adopted over time is a backup power source. For the first time, there's more solar being installed as backup capacity than diesel in India. Wow. So even in my, like, even in my family home in India, now if the power goes off, what trips on is a solar and a battery. That's so And this cool. in my mind, is the big opportunity for a company like Tesla, is the deployment of power walls and power packs to help families, to help businesses go behind the meter to ensure that power reliability. 
the point you bring up is really interesting that this is happening already because I think that signals a key sort of maybe it's consumers willing to pay a slight premium, but also just in general, the cost of implementing these solar and battery solutions is actually getting to the point where it's almost competitive with diesel and maybe operating it. It's a faster uptime. It's easier. It's cleaner. So people are actually going with it. Like to me, that's so exciting that that's already happening. And then I think about, you know, the solar roof opportunity um, with those power walls and like that kind of combination to be a micrograder behind the meter solution for a lot of like people in India, you know, I just think this is so like the more and more I've thought about the solar roof and just how energy hits every single building and we're never collecting it is just such a waste. And especially in India where it's like hot and you have a lot of sun, um, like there's probably so many rooftops that are just not generating energy. And now it's just about building this infrastructure one by one. And it's almost like an amazing gift that all this te new green technology is ready so they can rebuild from scratch without this legacy infrastructure to fossil fuels and all that kind of stuff. One more difficulty when it comes to the uptake of technology like solar in India, and this goes to the last two categories on the stage of non-rural consumers and CNI. So here in the United States, if you wanted to go out and finance a construction project on your house, like solar, you would qualify for financing by the fact that you have a credit history and that you have a FICO score. FICO scores and credit histories don't exist in India at the same level in which they're here in the Western world. And so that's why if solar deployers are not working for a government, they're usually going after the commercial and industrial sector. So throughout India, there's you know large industrial parks where businesses from all over the world, Indian or otherwise, are operating in conjunction. And there's just greater peace of mind when you're a solar deployer to know that a CNI client is going to pay their bills as compared to an individual consumer who doesn't have a FICO score or an equivalent. So the power pack opportunity is massive for that reason. Yeah, and it's pretty cool because this is maybe the first example I could ever think of where Tesla it makes more sense for them to build a gigafactory for power walls and behind the meter storage and grid scale batteries and the solar roof versus vehicles. Like that's the real opportunity in India first. And then as you fix these sort of energy supply chain issues, then that will sort of naturally open up the market for electric vehicles. And so it seems like it's almost a reverse where like China, Tesla's going first for vehicles. In India, it would make a lot of sense for Tesla to go first for grid and energy. Um, and I see that as the huge opportunity of like, should, if Tesla was going to do an Indian Gigafactory today, what would they do? Immediately start building grid batteries and solar roofs um, as opposed to, to cars, um, which I think back is in like- 2015, Back in 2015, Narendra Modi, who is the prime minister of India, visited the Tesla factory. And that's what he said. He said, I'm here because I think battery storage can help our grid. So this has been an ongoing conversation. Now, I don't know about if Tesla has any plans with India. I would love to hear them talk about it on, a, on an earnings call or at the AGM or maybe even at Battery Investor Day. But I'm willing to bet that since that conversation between Narendra Modi and Elon in 2015, that this has at least been a coal in the fire within the company. And I hope it happens in the future. Yeah, and Elon did say, because they opened up Model 3 reservations for India, and he did recently say to a customer on Twitter that they would soon have an announcement about entering the Indian market. Because at this point, you know, I, at my guess is, I think they thought they would already be selling some cars into India by now, but have hit some regulations. And I recall Elon saying at a shareholder meeting that it was a lot due to government's like just sort of friction with the government of import taxes, not enough built in India and that sort of headache is why they hadn't entered it yet. So I don't know, I'm sort of curious, really, really curious because I'm like, Tesla's got the technology, India needs it. Like, is there going to be a shoot a drop here? Huge potential, but maybe it, I could also see it never happening. And if it doesn't happen, by the way, like, yeah, I love Tesla. I'm a former employee of the company. This space is much bigger than just one company. Totally. There's there's a lot of good work being done by startups in India, by the incumbents in India, and they will continue to do that work for India, regardless of if Tesla enters or not. And so moving on to the next piece, India's battery supply chain, this is where India, in terms of the uh, raw materials lottery for batteries, uh, sort of got the short end of the stick and has like nothing, uh, you know, but I've been, I recently did an episode and talking about this whole thing of like, well, can we get new materials and batteries that are easier to come across, you know, all that stuff is in the future. But up until this point, a big friction and sort of maybe delay on the Indian EV economy has been this lack of access to the raw materials needed. Um, and, and they would have to import all those. And so, 
Yeah. Yeah. What we can see here on slide 17 is, I mean, China is everywhere on this page, except for the nickel raw materials piece. But China dominates graphite supply, lithium supply, cobalt supply. India is not on this page at all. That is highly concerning. Because then the question is, where will they get these materials? They're going to have to import all these materials. So even if the battery cells are being manufactured in India, even if the, the vehicles are being manufactured in India, it's still a heavily import reliant business. And this is no different than the import reliance that India has had for oil since its independence over 70 years ago. And so one solution that has been put forward both by the government in India, but also by companies. And at this point, I really want to thank my friends at Atero Recycling, who are a recycling company based in India, for educating me on how the recycling market in India works. It is due to the absence of there being primary materials mining happening in India, but the fact that there's such a large market for cell phones, for two wheelers, for cell phone towers that have lithium ion batteries, you can essentially create an urban mine through the recycling of materials. Wow, this is such a cool concept. And it almost the more and more I've been thinking about this of like, you know, did Elon Musk watch our previous episode about supply chains and the lithium and, and all that kind of stuff? Or is he thinking about it as like a one off expense? Like once we get enough materials for 5 million cars and they're in India and then we can recycle it and maybe get enough raw materials to build three or 4 million cars, like that mine was like not like a perpetual expense and supply that's needed. It was like a one time upfront investment to get all the stuff out of the ground and then we can recycle it or at least, you know, recycle a good enough amount to actually start to be that new supply chain. I guess that's the sort of concept of this urban mine theory. Um, and that's like, you know, we've seen J.B. Straubel go into uh, recycling with redwood materials. And I think it's really interesting to see what you just said, not just battery materials recycling, but, you know, how did J.B. and Elon even get the start their idea for Tesla? They were putting laptop batteries together and cell phones. So isn't there a ton of laptop and cell phone batteries that also need to be recycling that are also using a similar lithium ion technology? So it's not even just EVs, it's also electronics, like you're saying, even potentially circuit boards. And so I think there's a lot of um, potential and it's and it's just interesting to think about like once you get it out of the ground you know we if we can keep it in India um, that will significantly re reduce our reliance relative to like let's say fossil fuels where we just constantly have to be importing them the CEO of one of the largest telecom towers operator in India is a friend of mine and he once told me that there's something like 800 gigawatt hours of lithium-ion batteries in cell phone towers so you don't need a big feedstock of electric vehicles in order to do this kind of refining and this kind of recycling in India. Now, another idea that's been suggested to me in recycling is, well, why not just take battery cells that have been used in other jurisdictions and then use them in India? And the reason we can't do that is what we've described over here in slide 16. So we, our team at Benchmark, went on and did a study where we talked to consumers and producers of vehicles in India about what characteristics they would like to see in the battery cells that are being used to power two wheelers and three wheelers in India. And we found that there are a few characteristics that you need to succeed in the Indian automotive battery market that just may not be true. So first of all, once again, the metric that matters the most is cost. Everybody talks about dollar per kilowatt hour cost everywhere in the world, but it is especially valid here in India. Like cost is gonna be the most important objective measure that's used. But then after that, it's what you said, solar irradiation is high, India is a very hot place, and the temperature operating range of the battery matters as well in India due to that. The battery management system that you need for a two-wheeler or three-wheeler, the swapping capability that you need for two-wheelers and three-wheelers necessitates a very different design for an Indian automotive battery application as compared to a Tesla design, for example. And this is getting me to my sidetrack moonshot of like, this idea of Tesla and Arkimoto working together and that Tesla could supply, like I've always had this idea of like, would it make sense for Tesla to make an equity investment in Arkimoto, um, supply them with batteries in the powertrain, as opposed to partnering with some other car companies competing with them directly, partner with Arkimoto, who's in an adjacent vehicle category, um, you know, which is, uh, they're like, okay, that kind of makes sense on paper, I guess. But then you think it through of like, well, look at India, the Model 3 and Model Y are not going to do well in India. But an Arkimoto, like two to three wheel vehicle is exactly what will crush it in India. So if 
Tesla doesn't have to do any of the work, but if they were supplying the batteries and powertrain, you know, Arkimoto can do its thing and set up a factory in India. Like this is a perfect sort of example if you think it through of how an Arkimoto or Tesla going into this smaller form factor of electric mobility has huge potential and they're leaving a lot of money on the table and a lot of their mission on the table by not being able to build a product that addresses the Indian market. Like that's what I'm really seeing right now is nothing in their segment, maybe Cybertruck to do deliveries and work in India would be awesome. But like the, Tesla doesn't have a product to address the Indian market. And that's where I'm like looking at this and I'm like, man, like Arkham, them partnering with Arkimoto and helping giving them the technology to do it makes so much sense. Could be, it could be that they partner with Arkimoto. Once again, I don't know. So if that is a conversation that's ongoing, that would be very exciting. If Tesla puts out a two-wheeler or a three-wheeler, that would be very exciting. Right? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's it's, sort it's of where possible. I'm going with this. this. It's like, Tesla's there's still a some... company that's only 17 years old. There's still so much that the company can do. Electrification as a trend in India on the Indian roads is still only 10 years old. There's still so much that can happen in terms of business model innovation. Yeah. And it's like when you think about that atomic unit of Tesla, which is that battery, you know, that's why I say it's like Tesla's developed this technology that takes so long to be monetized because even though, yeah, the Model Y and Model 3 aren't going to do well or don't matter for India, the cheapest, most efficient, most sustainably, most easily recyclable battery cell is exactly what India needs, whether it's in a two or three wheeler, whether it's in the power pack or power wall, um, storing your energy, like the solar roof technology, like these are all uh, things that Tesla's developed that could be massively monetized in tapping into this geography. Um, and maybe that could segue us into our, our final thing here, which is why we haven't seen Tesla enter in, which is this market entry strategy, um, the sort of way the Indian economy works. I guess you have Mukesh Ambani here on the slide. Um, he's sort of like the king of India, like he's the richest guy, he's on the Forbes list. I, I wanna talk through the slide by giving a little bit of a precursor. So yes, I have a strong connection to India, but in the end, when I go to India, they still look at me like I'm American. Because to truly do business in India, you have to understand India. And to truly understand India, watching this, you know, watching this 45 minute discussion that we've had is just a brief introduction. Spending two or three weeks in India is just a brief introduction. This is a very complicated country. It's more like 30 different countries in one country. 16,000 languages are spoken in India. Yes. The, the business class, the, the government, they all speak English and conduct business in English. And there's a strong Indian diaspora all over the world who are well-educated. But to take advantage of the opportunity of a 1.3 billion person market is a lot more complicated than the traditional market entry strategies. And once again, what worked in China will not necessarily work over here. This slide over here was motivated by Ross Gerber putting a comment on your tweet yesterday, which is look at the example of Apple in India. And I think like that hit the nail on the head, but here's a few more examples. Apple tried to go in and tried to sell extremely expensive phones with tariffs on it and just got wiped out by lower cost competitors like Geo and Vivo and Oppo. Wow. Yes, there are people with iPhones in India. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not like the unit sales are zero, but in terms of market penetration, the homegrown product set ended up beating them out. Geo is really interesting over here, and I'll get back to that in a second. And we see a few different examples, and all of these have happened in the last 10 years, by the way, of companies from Western countries trying to enter India and being outcompeted by the local homegrown company. So let's talk about Geo. Geo is super interesting. Mukesh Ambani, I, I just am really interested in all the business moves that they do, and I have, I've just really loved studying what Reliance as a company has done. So Reliance is India's biggest company. Mukesh Ambani, the Ambani family started and controls Reliance. Mukesh Ambani is one of the richest men in the world and he's Asia's richest man. And he's currently, I think the chairman of Reliance. So when Apple tried to come in and sell phones in India, right? When Vodafone started to come in and try to take advantage of the telco business and when Facebook in 2014 very publicly tried and failed to establish the digital platforms, Ambani said, all right, I'm going to start Geo and get this. He gave away the phones for free. He literally gave away the phones for free to people wow. in India. Um, there, there's a little bit more to it. Like you had to pay for it, but then you got a credit back and everything. But in reality, you got the phones for free. 
because he was betting on the growth of the data platform to be the value creator for that business. Wow. And now in the last four months during COVID, all of these companies that are around Mukesh Ambani's portrait over here have gone in and bought stakes in geo platforms. I mean, this has been like the fastest and most effective fundraising I've seen out of any company in India. And people are literally just throwing money at geo right now because they see that he's established a platform with hardware and software and telco integration in India to create what is simultaneously the Google, the Facebook, the AT&T, and the Motorola of India in one company. So a word of caution to any Western country trying to go into India that has never done it before. There is a graveyard of Western companies thinking that they could enter and the strategies that work for them in the US, in the UK, in Europe will work in India. And that is just absolutely not true. What I would strongly advocate as a business person is find a partner company in India. Have them help you with the local culture and context and in dealing with the local bureaucracy and the government. You can bring the technology, but technology without a market entry strategy is absolutely nothing. Wow. And it's so fascinating because this is where we get to like companies and politics merging, you know, it's such a like, they're not isolated. This is a geopolitical question. Facebook and Google kind of gave up and they're like, all right, to play the game, we got to play the game and get, you know, invest in this platform as well. So it's very interesting to see. And I guess I, I didn't appreciate that, you know, lesson learned for Tesla maybe to enter is like, who are they going to partner with? You know, are they going to have to sign a deal with Mikesh Ambani um, and get internet access for all of their Teslas? What's up with Starlink? That could cause some tension. Like, uh, I think it'll be really interesting. I, I guess I didn't think of that, but maybe partnering with one of the largest utility or energy companies or one of the automakers in India is another route for Tesla to go. Um, although Tesla, on the other hand, has shown an incredible ability to be the first to break out of norms of these geopolitical times. With China, they opened the first wholly owned factory. Everyone was saying, you can't do that in China. No one's ever done that. And then all of a sudden, Tesla negotiates and figured out a way to build a wholly owned factory that still the government's backing. And so you know, Tesla's skill in actually navigating these geopolitical governmental situations is actually, I would say they have a very strong track record of doing it. So that to me makes it even more curious of like, maybe there's a, you know, one partnership that needs to occur before entering this geography. So I'm an insufferable optimist about Tesla's future, as I am about the future of India. And I will totally give credit to the fact that the partnership model had always been the paradigm in China before Tesla did it. Once again, just as a word of caution, China is not India. The trends that work in China will not work in India. Um, I'm sure that in this video, this video will be seen by many people in India and many of you will add comments over here about exactly how the Indian market is so misunderstood and so different. And I very much welcome that feedback. But my strong suggestion would be, you know, if I were an executive at a Western company I would not follow the example of the companies on the left-hand side of this page. I would not try to just go in and do it myself. You know, even I, as a person with strong Indian connections at this point, wouldn't try to go to India and do business by myself. Finding a local partner is key, especially in the transportation section, in a country with a rapidly rising middle class, the rapidly rising spending class that wants access to electrified transportation so that they can breathe more easily, so that they can get around their cities more easily. Yeah, and that's why I think it's so exciting. That's a perfect place to end the, the discussion is, you know, to open this up for the hyperchange subscribers and people watching of like, you know, this is all about ideas. That's kind of wanted to have you on the podcast of like, we know India is going to go green. We know they're going to go electric. Like, how's it going to happen? Which company is it going to be? Which product's going to succeed? Like, that's all up in the air. And the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. Like tremendously exciting. We're on the cusp of tens of billions of market value being created in these transportation and energy economies in India. Will Tesla capture it? Will it be a local company? How does that all play out? Like, that's what we get to watch. And I think that's so, so exciting. So I'm pumped that now I've learned a bunch from this. It's on my radar. I'm going to look into some of these Indian uh, companies that are making electric vehicles domestically and see sort of, you know, what the market is there and how that's expanding. Because from what you're saying, it sounds like you know, those are the companies who are moving. Those are the people who want the government to succeed. And that is history is on their side of having these smaller, cheaper local uh, companies win. 
So seriously, thanks again for coming on though, Vivas. I'm sure we're going to get requests to have you on again soon. <laughs> Yeah, and hey, just a quick logistical point. I want to thank all of the fans out there who watched my first video. I got 1,500 emails, tweets, and LinkedIn messages asking further clarification questions. I just cannot answer them all, but we're, we as the benchmark team are doing our absolute best to make sure that everybody at least gets their message looked at and potentially answered. So, you know, you can download these slides. We're, we're happy to put out the content for free. Feel free to email me, tweet me, send me a LinkedIn message. I will do my absolute best. Our team will do our absolute best to get back to you. But once again, you know, this was an honor for me to be able to come and talk about India. It's a country that I have a very strong connection to. The electrification and mobility space, the lithium ion battery industry is really the industry that I consider to be my home. I would love for nothing more than to one day go back to my hometown of Chennai, look at the sky and see a clear blue sky. This is the hope and dream of every single Indian who lives in the city. This is the hope and dream for every Indian who lives in the West who goes back home on a frequent basis, that our children and our children's children can see a clean India. Electric vehicles, lithium ion batteries, this is one part of the solution for our country. Awesome, well, that's a perfect place to end it. I love that clean energy vision. Um, and I can't wait to see how it all unfolds. Thanks again, Vivas. Uh, put all the links below so people can hit you up. I'm sure you'll be getting another 1,500 emails and messages after this one. Um, but yeah, peace out, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you all next time.